People are not hungry in the world because there isn't enough food. There's plenty of it. But between the bursting warehouses, the people who are hungry stands a tall obstacle. Now, Kapczynski's talking about food here, but it's the same with surgery. Over 90% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa just can't access surgery. There aren't enough surgeons, aren't enough operating rooms. That's not true in Europe, in the US. Comme moi-même, j'ai porté aussi la tumeur. Bon, il n'y avait pas, il n'y a pas de moyens. Elle était encore enfant. Donc, à partir de 20 ans, ça sera plus gros. Comme dit Docas, il y a Docas qui veut nous aider sur les vies. Que 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 by five years, more than half of the children who are born with cataracts have already died. Here in Africa, and especially in West Africa, where we are, these people have got no access to medical care. So when they get a burn, they often get infection, the wounds go deeper, they lose more skin, and the only way that the body can heal that is by pulling the skin edges together. And if it's over a joint, it will just pull that joint up into a, a immobile fixed position. That's almost half of the work that, that I, as a plastic surgeon on a ship, would do is to release these contractures and give them function back of their, of their joints. Contrefili <laughs> I have a lot of because I have a lot of money, 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 I have a lot of money. So, I have a lot of money, I have a I treated a captive and pilot patient years ago. This patient's name is called Hard Time. They've been christened by his mother for hard time. And can you imagine being called a cursed name like that? And to me, it's God's miracle ship, bringing all the volunteers free of charge uh, equipment to change the life so that these patients now have got a new life. Mercy ship is a very thin place. Why? Because it's so thin between heaven and earth. You can actually reach out to heaven. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his answer was very simple. His answer was love God, love others. And one way we can do that is through providing good healthcare. There's so many stories you'll hear from patients of how they got their injuries or their lack of access to healthcare and having to walk for miles and they've been to this hospital and that hospital and they can't afford it. And you take that all on board, but we're not built to take all of that and hold all of it and God just wants us to lift it off and give it back to Him. Our four core values fit in very well. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like the first. Love your neighbor, love each other, love one another. Third, we've added two more to our four values. Be a people of integrity. Let your yes be yes, no deceit. If you don't have integrity at the end of your life, you don't have much. And the last one is excellence. 
we should do everything, whether it's in the galley, whether it's food preparation, whether it's cleanup, whether it's laundry duty, whether it's surgery. We should aim for excellence because that reflects the heart and character of our God. Hello, my name is Taylor Perez. I am captain of the Global Mercy. Welcome. Welcome to the Global Mercy. Welcome aboard. Welcome on board the Global Mercy. Welcome to the Global Mercy. My name is Jane White. I'm from Northern Ireland. I'm the ward manager here on the Global Mercy. My name is Johnny. I come from Benin, and uh, my role on the ship is Gallic team leader. Hello, my name is Catherine Dungworth. I'm from Rosendale in Lancashire. I'm the Grade 1 teacher and the lead elementary teacher here on board the Global Mercy. My name is Lawrence Jackson IJ from Ghana. I'm the ship's bosun on the Global Mercy. My name is Larry Olupaima. I'm a chaplain on board the Global Mercy and I'm from Nigeria, West Africa. Welcome on board the Global Mercy. My name is Jim Patterson and I was responsible for constructing the ship. But this is the world's first purpose-built hospital ship. The military so far have always used conversions as we did in the past. So this is the first time a hospital ship has been built from scratch. There are six wards here, in them A through F, and then there is 102 ward beds. The ship itself, it comprises about 8,900 tons of steel. There's about 3,000 tons in the accommodation. There's about 700 kilometers of electrical power cable. We have brand new equipment. So we have top of the range CT scanner and X-ray equipment. When the ship is with patient and the crew, we have 3,000 mil per day. The ship's about the size, a little bit longer actually than a British soccer field. It's 174 meters. I think the longest soccer field is supposed to be 140. The ship's 28.6 meters wide. The, I think the narrowest soccer field is 45 meters. We don't have any rudders. Um, but we can still steer. <laughs> what we have hanging underneath the stern are two azipods, and basically those are just a giant electric outboard motor, and it will swivel 360 degrees, and we can push the stern in whatever direction we need it to go in order to get the bow pointed in the right direction. So the academy here on the Global Mercy is run just like any school would be. We have children from the age of three all the way to the ages of 18. And so we run from preschool through to grade 12. Our fuel is uh, marine gas oil, which is uh, low sulfur, so it's uh, the most environmentally friendly fuel. Six meters below the water line and 40 meters above the water line. We have four diesel generators, which create the power for everything, for the propulsion, the hospital, the galley, everything on the ship is powered by these four diesel generators. 3,000 kilowatts each, or three megawatts each. That probably doesn't mean a lot to people, but you can plug 3,000 electric kettles into one generator. So when we talk about doubling the number of people served, it's based on reality. We know what we could do with the Africa Mercy, and this ship can take the Anastasis, the first ship, the Africa Mercy, the one we're currently using, the Caribbean Mercy that has now been decommissioned, and you can combine, and the Good Samaritan, you can combine them all together, put them in this ship, and still have room left over. So part of the reason that's easy to say double the impact is that's literally what will happen. We will serve twice as many people in so many areas. We have many doctors on board both our vessels, the Africa Mercy and the Global Mercy. Uh, we've got surgeons and we've got anaesthetists and we've also got people who are physicians that look after the patients on the ward. Um, so anaesthetists we have, sometimes they are doctor anaesthetists, sometimes they're nurse anaesthetists. And then the surgeons come from a range of specialties. So we do women's health surgery, general surgeons, orthopaedic surgeons, um, maxillofacial surgeons and plastic surgeons are just some of the range of um, the doctors that we have on board the vessels. Over the last however many years that we've been operating on the Africa Mercy, we've learned a lot. And we've taken that learning and put it into this hospital. The equipment is modern. It's the same equipment that we would see in hospitals in the US or in Europe. 
And we've really doubled down on this idea of training, doubled down on this idea that we aren't just here to deliver surgery, it's important. We're also here to help build the capacity in the country. So a large part of the hospital here is devoted to, is dedicated to, purpose-built to training surgeons, anesthetists, nurses, biomed tech, et cetera. When patients are coming on board, one of the first departments that they stop in is radiology. So they have some investigations, first of all, which will help the surgeons. So I count that such a privilege that we are welcoming the patients on board and we are the first ones to say, we hope that we can help you come in and we'll have some investigations. And to see some of our patients, there is a lot of fear, there is a lot of concern about what the scans will show. But to be there and to be a support for them is just, it's such a privilege. And we, when we get to see them afterwards on the ward or they come for um, x-rays after their surgery and you see the difference in them and the children when their legs are twisted and then they have their surgery and they come back to see us and we see them walking down the hall, it's just the best feeling in the world and we have the honour really to see them before and afterwards. I love my nurses and my team. That's, that brings me the most joy is to see them thrive in a place like this. And, uh, come in a little bit scared of not knowing what to expect, but walking alongside them and saying, if I can do it, you can do it. I came for seven months. I'm here now almost 11 years. In one location, one of the patients said, nobody is sitting beside me, even on the queue. I have no hope. I'm going to leave. You know, nobody can ask to help me because they smell the stench. And the crew member reach out, touch her shoulder, and the, this crew member say, you are the reason we're here. And that patient, after surgery, then related this story to us and say, I was about to leave, but someone touched my shoulder because I have been in touch for the last 20 years. And that human contact. So it's not just surgery bringing hope and healing. It's the whole crew members, the first interaction, the first smile, the first touch. Just like Jesus using his healing hands. I'm sure he used his healing smile, although he doesn't mention much of the Bible, but I'm sure his facial expression, the smile, the touch, that started healing. I've been captain on the Anastasis, uh, chief mate and captain on the Caribbean Mercy, captain on the uh, Good Samaritan, which became renamed the Island Mercy and the captain on the Africa Mercy and chief mate on the Africa Mercy. And now I'm the captain on this one, the Global Mercy. <laughs> I love the aspect that this is a teaching hospital. I love the aspect of the medical capacity building. Um, the surgeries are marvelous, but the surgeries are individual, touches individuals. The capacity building, the teaching, just improving the entire infrastructure of a country is huge. 50% of the crew here on board are actually non-medical because you need so many people to build this community and so many people to feed into it in order for the patients to get the surgeries that they're having. And I love the fact that we're not coming in to, you know, we're gonna make things better for you. We're invited in. What do you need? They be partners. It's not a, a push in, it's a come in, we're welcomed. And you know, we want, we're there, how can we help you? Not I'm going to help you. It's just a, a different mindset. And I think it's a godly mindset. My name is Lawrence Jackson IJ from Ghana. I'm the ship's bosun on the Global Mercy. The Global Mercy has 12 decks, you know, and you have to keep it clean <laughs> and tidy. By the time you start from deck 12 and get to deck seven, where is my area, you have to go back again because she's so big. And also I'm involved in training. So although my role on board is the radiology department, one of the other uh, functions that the crew can do is they can sign up to be blood donors. Some of the surgeries that we perform, uh, patients need blood transfusion. So you can sign up to be a donor, so you become a walking blood bank, and they will call you or page you if you're needed to donate for a patient before or after surgery. 
So I have experience of being on board and uh, my colleagues in the lab asked for a donation of uh, B-negative blood because we had a patient who was due for surgery. So I was able to uh, go and donate my unit on board uh, for that patient. So it's, uh, you're helping out in other departments that aren't just your own. So when you think about living on board um, a ship and this life that we get to live, it can seem quite strange to think I'm giving up my whole life to come on board here, but actually the community that is on board is, it's, it's just wonderful and there's no other place that it's like. I'm from a small town and so it feels that I have this small town around me as well. So all of these people from this international community become your family and the people that we meet from our host country as well, they will teach you uh, local phrases and you become part of that family as well. So it doesn't feel like a sacrifice. It feels actually such a blessing that we get to be part of this world and part of this work that we are doing um, and just meeting people from different parts of the world and their journey and their faith stories about how they have become involved in the organization as well. And that's just a joy to hear. Objectively, the, that's the major responsibility of the, um, the chaplaincy department. We support the crew uh, spiritually emotionally and of course physically. Yeah, uh, we create an atmosphere for the crew to come to chaplaincy and share their burden and then we pray along with them, we process with them and then we pray along with them so that as they volunteer and serve uh, in their different role, they holistically perfect spirit, soul and body. Our family dynamic was strengthened by being present together all the time and in everything and the work that I was doing on board took me to all areas of the ship and so we were bumping into each other all of the time and being able to share in everything we're doing mm. so my work directly related to the life of my family mm. and the other families on the ship uh, we got to experience so much together so some of the trade-off is your your back garden is the port a port with uh, lots of trucks around uh, doing lots of things, but those things became experiences for us, shared experiences. Yeah, but also actually being together in such a close environment and community and everything's very tight knit and you're kind of, you know, in each other's spaces a lot of the time. In some ways it benefited us, but it also benefited the organisation. Like at one point, um, Ali was operation director and being a dad suddenly in that role meant that he had insight into an entirely different part of the ship life that he could implement into his work setting. It's amazing, it's a great community. It's also a little bit strange. Sometimes you're operating and you know, we're docked, but the water can be a little bit more rough. There are times that the OR light has just gone whoop away from you. Living with 400 people, 600 on this ship, um, you know, it's a small village. Only about a third of the crew are medical. Uh, the other two thirds are everything that's necessary to support the ships, everything that's necessary to support the hospital. Uh, so you meet people from all walks of life. Some of my best friends genuinely have come from the 14 years I've been on Mercy Ships. All of this, essentially think of this as a small floating village. And everything you would need in a village to make a village happen, we would need here too. For me, community is a difficult word, concept to adequately explain. You know when you have it, <laughs> that's made up of 40 to 50 nations, multiple mother tongues. So you have to have a central purpose greater than the community. Community for community's sake, that has failed many times in history. So what is the reason for the community that we have on board this ship and the Africa Mercy. It's that we follow the 2000 year model of Jesus. We're all here with a common goal. We do believe that he's called us to serve others, in particular to focus on Africa. We have times of worship. We have this incredible chapel that allows people who are more traditional in their worship form to come and be quiet. And we allow other times of worship where everyone is applauding and clapping the goodness of God. How you worship is very private and personal. And it, we should allow the facilities on this ship, and we do, 
so that you can worship in the form that you are, with which you are most comfortable. I think my joy is when I see the crew happy, when they could serve the Lord with joy, when they could sing to the Lord with joy, they could be happy as they serve the Lord. That's, that's my joy as a chaplain. Living on the ship, a special mercy ship, is an opportunity for us to make a friendship and to learn from different kind of culture, I've said, yeah, and uh, know is have a lot of memory from different people, and it's a blessing place. My greatest joy is probably uh, the people that I get to work with. We're facilitators. So we are supporting the people that are doing the hard work that goes on in the hospital. Um, and it is very difficult long hours that they work. So, but this is, everything is designed, I guess from a, from a kid, I've been the person, you know, I pick up the trash and help, you know, I, it's just innate. It's what God put into me. And uh, so the joy is being able to help other people, whether it's mentoring, officers that are here or the day crew that's another whole other thing that we do we have day crew that come on board higher in the ports that we are they help in for language they help with patient care they help on the in the deck side for maintenance on the ship and that sort of thing and we many of them end up coming becoming part of our crew and then advancing in rank and learning so all of it the teaching the mentoring just the fellowship and getting to work with incredible people. 2016, I was a deckhand, and now 2022, I'm an able seaman, and that means I'm not qualified to work any kind of ship. You can trust me, give me any kind of job, but when I was a deckhand, I need somebody to look after me. So these are my position, it was really good. I am in awe of the quality of the people that I get associate with, and uh, I just kind of, it's all very surreal, <laughs> to be quite honest. But yeah, I love community. Without the community, there won't be hope and healing. You know, you can imagine if the ship, just, just all surgeons will run riot, you know. <laughs> it won't work. So I always remember the nurses looking after the wounds of patients that I have inflicted, you know. And without the nurses, the wound won't heal as nice. And also while they're healing, the ward pastors, the other nurses, the other non-medical staff who invite them to come and uh, we got a system in the, in the old days, we call adopt a patient, you don't take the patient home, but you adopt the patient to get to know them before surgery and then after. And it's that interaction to show you are one of us, you know, you are just as a human being, even though before surgery, you know, they've been, as I said earlier, been shunted, been ostracized, been isolated. But our crew member will say to them, you are the reason we are here. Whether you're medical, non-medical, you've got a skill, we'll make use of you. Why? Because the ship is run by a village. It's not run by a surgical team. No, we're just part of it. Anybody who needs to make a village work, we need you because we are a village. Being here is a big life change for not just adults, but especially children. Um, immersion ships are very good at working on the transition for both the adults and the children to come here. We have something called onboarding and kids onboarding, which prepares long-term people to service, and that is the families. And that prepares children for how life's gonna change, what they're gonna miss when they're leaving behind, because we all leave things behind, but also it prepares them for what's to come, and the excitement, and the things that they're gonna see, and the things they're going to experience and the cultures they're going to learn about and we very much do that as we're here. We talk about transition, we talk about the things that maybe they're finding hard but also the good things as well and that's all part of coming here and really transitioning onto the ship and Mercy Ships do a great job at helping people with that and here in the academy we want to do that too and the children are our prime concern here as teachers in the academy and we want to make sure that they are happy, they're here to serve and to know that they are valuable 
people on board this ship as well. They are coming to serve as much as their parents are and we want them to know that and know that they, they impact the patients when they see them out on deck seven playing. They impact the patients when they see them on the dock. They have that impact just as much as the adults do. And so it's so important that we transition those children. We've always felt so well looked after and just to know that there is someone on the ship, a doctor on ship and nurses on ship, that if there's anything wrong with our kids, that we would just be able to pop down and talk to them and have someone that not only is it's a bit more because your doctor in your home country might not know you very well, whereas here, the doctor that you speak to knows who you are, they know who your child is and they would look at them and be like, Oh yeah, they're definitely not themselves, are they? Because they see them running around the halls, they see them running around the, the galley. And so I often think that actually we get even more um, attention and love and um, care within like medical setting here than we would at home, actually. We have seen families bond mm. in a way they've never before because you have to adjust and you have to adapt and your safety and security is with the people you know and love most close to you in your cabin, mm. but they. But you also know as parents that outside of this cabin are hundreds of people ready to love your kids, to speak in their own language, to present their culture and, and things to them. That it's really quite a rich environment for the children. It's, yeah. it's almost a um, melting pot of, of all those different cultures. Community is just amazing. Uh, you just get to meet a lot of people from different countries have been to the ship and connect with them, telling them about their countries and also getting to know people. And for me, being on the ship is about people. Uh, the ship is just a tool. Uh, and the relationships I built over the years have really served me well and to keep me going and serving as well. Cooking for international people, because it's not only about one, country means you have to cook so it's an opportunity for me to learn more and be able when I leave the ship to do some things different from my own country. So throughout the year one of the things that we get to experience as a community on board um, either the Africa Mercy or the Global Mercy is that people bring their own cultural traditions whether it's celebrating Santa Lucia from the Scandinavians at Christmas or um, the Dutch are celebrating uh, their day and everything's orange. It just brings such laughter to the community and we get to experience um, things that we would never normally have at home living in Scotland. It was just amazing to have a toddler on board and just kind of watch them get on with so many different cultures and like at one point Lewis was learning language like English language but he used to say random words in Dutch didn't he? Mm -hmm. He had random words in Dutch random words in French, mm -hmm. he had some random Susu words from, from um, Guinea. Mm -hmm. And it's just so fun to see them grow and develop with so many cultures. Yeah, and thinking about family life, there's things that you want for your children, and you want the best for your children. And our academy is incredible, and the teachers are volunteers who have come to teach on board the ship. Their passion for their profession is the same as the passion of the nurses and the surgeons downstairs and the love and care they get from their teachers. I've never seen that anywhere mm. across the world. And they know your children, not just in the school setting, but they know you as a family and you know, and they're friends. And it's, yeah. it's, your, com it's your community teaching your children. The increased training capacity through African healthcare professionals observing multiple surgeries multiple times, learning by doing, and then doing under close supervision, then we know we will more than double the impact. I think personally, uh, the greatest example is Dr. Wodeme. I think that is our single, without a doubt, our single greatest example of capacity building from nothing to a center that trains multiple African ophthalmologists in cataract surgery. And he's replicated that training now to six or seven different African nations. He's training a few dozen, but it'll soon be hundreds of African healthcare professionals 
That will change African healthcare delivery, not mercy ships, but the capacity building of the locals. They'll change it themselves. Surgical training is still very much an apprenticeship model. Uh, I learned surgery from somebody who'd learned surgery from somebody before him, and so on and so on. So surgical training, you can't learn surgery from a book. Surgical training is more than just learning the anatomy. It's learning how to navigate around the anatomy. It's learning how to handle the tissues. Some of that can be done in a simulation center, and we have dedicated space on this ship for simulation. We also have dedicated capacity here to allow the surgeries that are being done on these tables to be observed by people uh, outside the room itself. I want them to take over my job. I want them to experience what I've experienced over the last 11 years and just fall in love with, number one, the ship and the work we do and the nations that we serve. It's just amazing to, to work on the ship. Being a seaman, I was used to rough life. Uh, just your work, no relationship. But here in Massachusetts, it's about relationship and work and serving God and serving one another. Uh, it is just amazing to see people come on board, uh, get alongside, get to know them, and get to you know, work with them from the start and see growth. My journey training program I start with, um, I did BST, and that is basic safety training and where you have to do firefighting and do swimming classes, survive technique, because the ship is gonna be in the middle of the ocean. If something happens, you need to have to figure it out. So it was kind of like a basic, but it doesn't require any high qualification. All you need is ready to do the training. So it was really good thing for me, and I really enjoyed it. When I tried to learn this career, and there was a lot of people who inspired me, and they give me the courage, they say, hey, Abdullah, I think you can do this. And this is how we want to do it. Um, we want you to go for the training. Of course, the ship that paid for me to do it. And then they were so happy, and they give me all the basic needs that I need to do the training. And that was something I'll never expect, because it's not something I was planning for, but the ship put that thing in me and now it's something I'm enjoying and absolutely I'm loving it. Now people with burn contractual get surgery. They don't need to wait or to, to go abroad to have uh, treatment. Also, uh, as I'm in a teaching hospital, I'm part of training other surgeons so that they can be able to perform some plastic surgeries. And with Mercy Ship support, we are also involved in training new surgeons, especially when they are beginning with essential surgical skill workshop that Mercy Ship helped us to do in Benin. What I really uh, enjoyed with the training with Mercy Ship was once you are trained, you get the training of trainer training so that you are able to train other people so that you can continue impacting even the ship is not there. So it's what I really appreciate about the training with Mercy Ship. It's important so because people can be trained in their home country with the patient they will be treating in their daily practice. They don't need to go abroad for training because it will be available in their homeland, what I did not have when I was looking for my training in plastic surgery. When we think about surgery, we tend to think about health. When you see any of the pictures you'll see of these patients with the tumors, it's really easy to see the tumor as a tumor, as a problem to be solved, a puzzle to be, to be fixed, something to be taken out, which is really important. And it's, it's what brings patients to us. But these tumors are symptoms of a deeper underlying condition within the country itself, a deeper underlying disease that uh, those of us who work on mercy ships, I think, are, are driven by. These tumors don't just impact a patient's health. They impact a patient's ability to go to work or to school. They impact a patient's ability to be integrated within their community. We've done some research recently to see what happens to patients in the year after their surgery. And we find that their health improves, which is fairly obvious, and we're glad we're finding that. Um, their health improves, but we're also finding 
that their income goes up after their surgery. And we're finding that the measure of health that they report improves the most is reintegration into their community. When I look at what Mauritius does in, um, in the area of reaching out to the people in Africa that we call the poorest of the poor, these are people that can never get the type of access that is needed to that particular type of surgery. They are not qualified in Africa, I can tell you that. And you see them selected by Mercy Shields and cared for for the number of months that they will be with us. The hospitals I see out in West Africa, they have nothing. And you can imagine, Mercy Ship is suddenly bringing, okay, it's not a big teaching hospital type ship. You know, it's a good district general hospital with a lot of latest equipment. Put it on the ship and arrive at the shore. You know, those patients in these countries, they have no experience of what a hospital, and yet we can bring them here, show them not just surgery, not just surgical healing, but love, human touch, human respect, equality, encouragement. And then we change the life by removing what they've been waiting for so long. And they come out of it, walk down the gangway, new life ahead of them. Wow. I don't think you get any better job satisfaction like this in the world. It's a heavenly job. Every human being has the right to be treated as human, to have a place at the table of the human race. La première fois, parce que j'avais regardé mon visage quand on m'a opéré hier. Parce que j'avais encore la bande bombe, bombe comme ça, je me disais que peut-être que mal. Mais quand on a enlevé la bande, premier pansement, j'ai dit que oui, me voici, est-ce que c'est vraiment réel? <laughs> to meet people who don't do a double take, who don't make comments, that don't look, and just love them for who they are. There's no words that can describe how she must have felt. When I was here, I didn't know how many people were here. Everyone who came here and came here, I could even fall down. Yes. I'm going to go J'ai découvert une vie nouvelle à Mensechi. Oui, pour moi c'est un miracle, pour moi et ma famille. Mercy Ships is designed to offer the very best in ophthalmology care in places where the access to that kind of care is limited or non-existent. What you see in, in here are these marvelous stories of mothers who've seen their children for the first time or children who've seen their mothers for the first time. We hear how, how lives have been changed, how people have been transformed simply with a gift of sight. Mercy 
wafifia mfule. If they're just left in a curled up position for their skin to just heal and do its own thing, then the skin will always just form in the same position as what the person is in. So after her burns, she probably spent a few months just all curled up with her family looking after her. So that's why the skin has formed very tight. Walitie intere kasila do melo me so ala bra madia abra ma be plein de fois en plaque bon te gamme taran ko fese gamme na ta nai wa bigo en blawa slala so to babu balika ala ya mademe love is, is the main basis of of our treatment here they they often often the outcasts in in life because of their deformities and just to to show them how important they are and that we can care for them. The love that's on the ship will just touch her and change her and, and then she will leave the ship with hands that can function much better than when she came on, on board. After four operations, we have been able to survive at the same time. But there is a problem Because <laughs> the fact that, you know, the ship comes in and we're a showpiece and we're a very visible sign, but Mercy Ships is involved ten, five, ten years with these countries. They're there before we get there, they're helping to select patients and things, but there after we leave to make sure that everyone's taken care of, uh, continue with the medical capacity building, make sure that what was set up and what was started is fully supported and not just, you know, pull up the anchor and head out and uh, say bye-bye. So it's a holistic approach to, to helping other people. So my hope for the Global Mercy is that we're going to be able to do so much more for our patients. 
Um, like I said, there's six ORs, there's six wards, there's 199 beds on this vessel. It's so much bigger than the African Mercy, which means we can do more for our patients. But we also have this fantastic training platform um, whereby we can do so much more training for those healthcare workers um, that we want to partner with in the countries. So I think the Global Mercy is going to be a real opportunity for us to collaborate with governments and local healthcare systems um, to be able to share our skills and really help local workforces um, train themselves up so that when we leave, we really leave a lasting impact. For healthcare in Africa, my hope is that we have many trained healthcare givers so that people can really assess to secure care and that they can be able to afford. Because right now, sometimes even the specialists exist, people cannot afford their treatment. So my hope is one day we got many specialists, well-trained, and also a system that can make people assess those care, those surgeries. That is my hope. My hope for the future is that we will focus all of our attention on this ship, seeing her brought to maximum capacity. And that's going to take some time. This is a big ship. This will allow us to do things we've only dreamed about. The day that the first patient walks up the gangway, that's, the, that's what it's all about. And we look forward to that day. The next chapter of Mercy Ships, I think, is one of the most exciting. We have, um, the organization has grown sufficiently to a level that we will be able to partner more in depth and with a clearer strategy of what it means to serve our African host nations. We come to listen, we come to serve, we come to partner. And I think the next chapter of partnering with ministers of health, missionaries, hospitals, government, is the most exciting phase in our history. I look forward to what's ahead.